It's December 6th, 1941. Lansdale, Pennsylvania is a booming town led by its commercial and industrial might. Not one of its 9,000 plus citizens knew that their lives and their country would change the very next day. Young men from across America began joining the armed forces in World War II, not knowing what to expect. Now, over 70 years later, five of these men from Lansdale Borough and the surrounding area have chosen to share their experiences from this catastrophic war. But just who are these men? Hello, I'm Zach McCool, lifelong resident of Lansdale and life scout from Troop 141 in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. With the help of my fellow scouts, North Penn Television, and the Lansdale Hometown Heroes Project, I present to you World War II, the men who were there. A story to my community about a time long ago by the men who were actually there. I am William Allender Reed. I was a buck private. I refused to take anything that I had to decide for someone else. I would go any place, do anything, but I didn't want to tell another guy to do it. Uh, uh, Norman Vincent, ship fitter first class, United States Navy. And I was in the amphibious force, and uh, taking Marines and, and uh, personnel, Army personnel into the beach. My name is James A. Schultz. I went in the Air Force, and uh, they gave me an instructor's job. My name is Bill Starr. I was in the Air Force. Well, I was a PFC when I went in. My name is Frank McRae. I was in the Navy from 1940 to 1946. I was a lieutenant junior grade. With America becoming deeply involved in the war following the attack on Pearl Harbor, many young men received their draft notice, but many selfless individuals chose to defend their country and join the military at their will. Were these men drafted or did they enlist? I enlisted in 1943, just out of high school, and went into the, well, I took basic in Fort Benning, Georgia, ended up going into France, into, well, I landed in France, ended up going into Germany, front line. I was a second scout rifleman, but my specialty was hand grenade launcher on my rifle. And so were you drafted or did you volunteer? No, I volunteered. You volunteered. Yeah. What, was, uh, what was the motivation uh, behind you volunteering? To go? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I felt that you're going to have to go. But I like to pick my service. I didn't want to be I didn't want to be in the army digging foxholes and all that stuff and marching. So I figured this way. <laughs> in the Navy, uh, which I always did like Navy anyway for some reason. With football, you know, I always watched Navy football. Was that as long as I had a ship under me, I had a place to sleep and good meals. Okay? That was my thinking. They pick which branch I wanted, but I did really want to fly. That was my first first offer. Was I wanted to be a pilot? By the way, my one son is a commercial pilot now. He he's doing now what I wanted to do, and but because of the war, it messed everything up. Because when I first went down to to Philly to sign up uh, for the Air Force. Uh, they said, uh, how many years of college did you have? And I said, no, I'm just out of high school, just graduated. And they said, well, you can't, you can't get in the program because you have to have two years of college. He said, but even if you had one year, he said, I would, uh, I would maybe stretch it and let you in. The ROTC program it was, they still have that. 
And uh, so he said, that's, uh, that's out. So I couldn't get near, I couldn't get to be a pilot. Uh, so I just wound up in the, which was, happened to be at the time of the war, the amphibious force, the invasions were starting out in the Pacific. And everything, all the priorities at that time was the amphibious force and the zealous T's. So everybody that was coming in got thrown in that section, the amphibious force. And that's how I wound up in there. And, uh, and I served in the Pacific the whole time. I was home for a 130 day leave in, in the three and a half years. The rest of the time I was on the ship, except for boot camp and school. I had six months of school in Norfolk, Virginia, shipfitter school. And uh, that's how I became in, in the shipfitter. I was uh, drafted when I was 18 years old. I have uh, three brothers, they were all in the service. And uh, I guess because I was sort of uh, handicapped, I would burn when I was five years old. And uh, when the doctors looked at me, I figured they said, oh, you can't go into the infantry because it's a rough job. But uh, my brother went in, he was uh, elected to be a uh, sergeant in the infantry. And he was 18 when he was drafted, the same as I, but he went in the year ahead of me. So uh, we had quite a time. He, he was. He had, was in charge of three squads of eight men each. And uh, out of the 24 men, he was the, him and one other fellow were the only two to come out alive. In 1941, I was uh, working in Philadelphia in an insurance company when the Japanese uh, invaded Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, about two, make, two weeks later, I received my draft notice. The next day, I enlisted in the Navy, uh, in the Navy Air Corps. I wanted to be a Navy pilot. Before they saw any of Europe or the Pacific, these men had to endure rigorous training, so they had what it took to be a soldier. Just what was this training like? Well, they were uh, airplane mechanic school, uh, and flight engineering school and back to school. And I learned a lot for, from a boy that never had too much education. I started out and instead of going to first grade, they didn't know where to put me. When I was eight years old, I started school. So I missed the first four grades. They put me in a, a, a special class and did a lot of artwork. But other than that, not much education. But they took me, I guess I must have answered the right questions. And I learned all you had to learn about airplanes. And it was quite an experience anyway. I, was in, I went in the Navy and I was pulled into the boot camp on my birthday. My 18th birthday. What, uh, what camp was that? Pardon? What, uh, where did you train? Oh, Bainbridge, Maryland. It's no longer, I went down there later on uh, as we were out of the service uh, a few years later and the whole camp is not there now. It's a big, big development, housing development. They tore it all down because it was only a temporary thing, but the, 
That was a story all by itself, <laughs> being in there. Actually, I was trained uh, to locate any kind of uh, progress that they were making with their guns. I trained for about a year. I spent uh, three months at the University of Virginia, University of Richmond, um, which was all about uh, aerography. Then I went to Waynesboro, Virginia, where they had a small airfield, and I got into an airplane for the first time. It was a Piper Cub. And the instructor took me up for my first ride, uh, which was quite thrilling. And uh, I spent three months in Waynesboro learning basically how to fly. And uh, I got my pilot's license there. Uh, from there, I went to the University of Georgia and spent three months there. That consisted of a lot of physical exercise, physical training, swimming, boxing, um, rugby. Uh, the idea was to toughen us up. From there, I went to Glenview, Illinois, uh, Naval Air Station in Glenview, Illinois for advanced training. And uh, there we learned how to land in a 25-foot circle. Um, I had no problem doing my regular training, but when it came to being checked out, I could not get that airplane to land in that 25-foot circle. <laughs> it refused to do so, and as a result, I washed out of carrier training. And uh, that's when I was sent to um, Air Operations Officers School and I uh, got into control tower business. This question was partly inspired by Tim O'Brien's novel, The Things They Carried, which explores the physical objects carried by the soldiers of the Vietnam War. Since this is a different war entirely, I wonder just what equipment these soldiers carried with them. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that should have been issued to me never got in. A number of things that should have been mine, I didn't have the proper, I didn't have proper uniform, proper boots. I had the cheapest, they, they just ran out of stuff. They didn't expect the war to last that long. All we had was uh, dungarees and uh, dungarees and a blue shirt. That was uh, what we had on most of the time. But when we got off the ship to, to go to, uh, you know, uh, out for liberty, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, just a regular Navy uniform and the top and bottom and, and a hat, a white hat. And uh, you saw you saw them already. You saw Navy guys, I'm sure. They're still the same today. And... Uh, uh, the rations, we were fed three times a day, you know, and anything else we could get in between. And uh, the, cooks, the cooks used to watch their food pretty good. And uh, the bakers, so, uh, and the meals were sometimes rough eating because we were in a lot of storms. We got hit a lot of storms. I was in, this, in Okinawa, that was the biggest uh, well, they they call them something else out there, typhoons, I think. These things are getting, are 72 years old. They're getting. 
it's, we had the, our helmet and we had oxygen mask and we had a throat mic go around your neck like that. The rubber turned hard and I threw it away. Well, here it is. This is how we communicated with the others. This would go around your neck. And uh, like I say, everything here is 72 years old. And it's getting pretty beat, pretty well worn out. I had the A1 flying jacket, was a leather jacket. But uh, my brother upscounded that and he, he worked in the chemical factory and ate holes in it. The tanks, we had five tanks. And the tanks that we had there were all the type that would just go over top of the buildings and everything else. They walked right on through them. And we were stuck because we couldn't use them. Or we'd have won the war earlier. <laughs> we had, they had them all ready to go. It's just too much water. They didn't expect that either. We had uh, bombers. We came out there as uh, um, I guess you'd say a disappointed group because we couldn't use the airplanes to bomb in account of the weather. The weather kept kept us from doing doing it rained and rained and rained. And that's not fun when you're dragging all that mud on your feet. Well, I had five uniforms. I had dress blues. I had um, a basic um, air officer's green uniform. I had dress whites and um, dress khakis and uh, plain khakis. Did I leave anything out? They were all tailor-made, which was very nice. <laughs> and uh, the accessories that went with that. War can be unpredictable, but I learned that a daily routine can emerge, even in the face of extreme dangers. Oh, I had different assignments. I was a second scout. Not I was, I didn't get too much KP, but I wouldn't, didn't want any rank. It was just work. Working on a ship, you know, like the, the seamen and the others, all they did was they kept fixing the paint in the ship, chipping it with chipping, chipping, chipping with the chipping hammers, and uh, and paint anything to keep them busy, you know, to keep busy. And uh, in our in my department, we we usually always had something to do because it was the ship fitting. And it was like uh, well, first of all, the big thing was damage control. But for the daily stuff was plumbing and just like plumbers, uh, pipes stopping up and pipes breaking and and uh, uh, we just we was in a, it was like a regular job. We checked maintenance every day. In other words, down there, it's just a, I guess it's just yeah, not enough to keep you busy. But when when we weren't, we had at night times we had uh, some movies that would we could put up a movie screen. When we weren't in the in the, the actual battle area, and uh, we had some times on the islands where we pulled in and played softball on the islands and stuff. When we were the flagship, the captain was uh, our captain uh, loved to play. Uh, he was an older guy. He was 
at that time when I say older, <laughs> he was like in his 50s, and, uh, which is young to me now. And he liked softball. And so because we were the flagship, we could, he could pull some strings. And we went in on a beach many times there and, and got the crews together, a couple other ships, and had softball games. And I remember we used to let him, when he batted, we, just, we always let him get on base, drop the ball at first base or something. So, yeah, we had a good time. Uh, there were a the few times in between, you know, that uh, I remember that we weren't, but most of the time we were on the ship the whole time. Well, <coughs> pardon me, when we got up, I was in charge of the plane. Before we took off, I had to go sign up for 1B29. And it was mine. If we had an accident or anything, I had to pay for it. It only cost $100,000. But uh, a friend of mine went down with his, and he had to pay $2 a month to uh, cover the cost of the airplane. So I guess it didn't cover too much. But I never had any problems. We, we had a lot of, we had a pilot says, hey, Jim, do you feel that? flutter on the wing. Uh, I said, no, not back where I'm sitting. I used to have a panel. That was uh, the back of the co-pilot. And uh, I said, I didn't feel anything there. Yeah, but if you want, if you don't like it, we'll go back and get another plane. So we changed. We went back, changed planes. Two days later, they had a pilot and an engineer go up to check it out, and the wing fell off, and both of them were killed. So this, I think, that we had to put up with. We had fly. We could fly up to thirty thousand feet because the uh, pressure, the plane was pressurized, and uh, we had one of the. Gunner's turrets flew out, and all the oxygen went out. And we had things floating in the air. And some pilot, the radio operator, was, he kissed the ground when we got down because we dropped from 30,000 feet down to tw about 12 or 13,000. And uh, we had things like that. I had, initially, I, um, I was on an eight hour, 24 hour program, eight hour watches. So I was on for like from four to midnight, midnight to eight, and then eight to four. That's the way it rotated. Um, that was pretty much the way it worked. And there was another ensign who had to watch. When I was off, he was on, etc. Morale is a huge factor in war, from one single soldier to an entire army. As World War II dragged on, just what was the morale like in these men and their fellow soldiers? We had a lot of confidence in our outfit. I was 102nd Division, the Ozarks, and mostly we did very well. Well, I always dug a foxhole and I said no deeper than six foot, anything deeper than that was desertion. So I made sure I was protected, but so I could get out and take care of it if I was attacked. But again, I wasn't by myself. The Lord was with me always. Oh yeah, the morale was 
I thought it was pretty good. It seemed to go downhill, oh, after six months or seven months, and then the, the captain uh, would always find a way to, he'd come up with movies, you know, he'd uh, call over to another ship who had movies. Maybe we didn't have any. See, the bigger ships, they had all this. Even on their ships, they had like a Coca-Cola bar and an ice cream bar and stuff like that. And we had nothing like that. We were, we were just a piece of metal with, uh, with a toilet and a, and a sink. That was about it. So he always, uh, when he felt uh, that maybe he had to do something, he would get movies on, on there and stuff. But it was never, ever bad. we never had no fights or anything. I don't remember a fight or anything like that. So it never got bad. I don't know, uh, just like I said, that, that group, most of us were the same age. And, and in fact, when somebody in my crew, in my group, I had six men under me, and uh, the one of them would come on, he would, turned out he was 33 years old when we picked him up at one of the, and, uh, and, then, we, and then I remember <laughs> saying to him, how did, how did an old guy like you get in the Navy at this? Everybody else was 17 and 18, see? And he says, well, I'm not old. He says, but I mean, that's how, we, that's how you thought. He, he, he was in the service at 33 years old. And uh, I asked him, how did an old guy like him get in there? But uh, the stuff, you know, it's like that. And, uh, but we, we really, uh, I remember no, uh, no problems. Uh. Well, ups and downs. I had the, when I went in, I had Greenhorn lieutenants as dentists. And one worked on me, and it put the player, flowers out, flowers out, and they walked around showing the other dentist, look, I pulled the wrong tooth. So then they had to go back and buy the other. So I had trouble with my teeth all the whole time. And I still do because I'm getting old and my bones are shrinking. But uh, not really many problems. I did my job like everybody else. I think it was good. Uh, they, uh, all, they all, even even with the rain and that, they all were uh, willing to go and get over. They they wanted to stop those guns. Uh, the fellows were so tired and wet and all this, that they seemed to pick up more steam to get, out, get in there and get out. <laughs> Morale was very high. Um, virtually every one of my peers was enlisting. My brother, was drafted, but he became a ball turret gunner on a B-17, and um, his tours were over Germany, extremely d dangerous, and um, he and the guys who served with him were in constant fear that they would be killed, and many of them were. As far as my particular situation, where I was, uh, didn't involve very much personal danger. Uh, but I was doing what I was trained to do, and he was doing what he was trained to do, and. Uh, I didn't hear any objections from any of my friends about serving or being where they were. We would communicate, but we didn't talk very much about what we did. We would just talk a little bit more about their surroundings and girls and all of that business. <laughs> Living was no guarantee in times of war and many men looked to luck to help keep them safe. Did these men have any good luck charms or superstitions? No. 
except <laughs> I exhaled, thank you, Lord, <laughs> all the time. And I had some very close ones. I don't, never even thought about that or no, no, we had nothing like that. No, I, I didn't even think I didn't have time for that. But I, when we got up and started, I started the engines and uh, took care of the airplane. And that was it. After that, the pilot took off over to, to take us off and to fly. My mother gave me one of these when I went into the service, and I still have it. It's all beat up, but I read it every day. Germany and Japan eventually surrendered, leaving the Allied forces as the victors of the war. Just what was it like hearing the news of their surrender? I was very pleased about it, but I, the communication wasn't good. A lot of times we didn't know what was going on, where we were going, or anything about it. Like I said, we, were, we had 200 crews lined up waiting to take off. And they come around and said, hey, hold up, we're not going to take off because we dropped the bomb. We're going to see what the results of that uh, are. He said, that's it, you can go home. We actually could feel it, that we were moving in faster and faster. And when we got in the middle in there is when uh, they quit. And that, that's when we start celebrating. I couldn't believe it when they were circled us around the, the airport in there and we had to put our guns in a big pile <laughs> and uh, I, I just never thought they would do that. Uh, I was uh, still there in uh, Naval Air Station in uh, Honolulu and uh, Word just came into our base from every direction that uh, uh, Japan had surrendered. Or, no, Germany had surrendered first, that's right. And uh, we knew it was pretty much over, and the news was not all that exciting. But when we heard that Japan had surrendered, we had a big parade down the Capilano Boulevard in Honolulu, and a lot of excitement, and we were all very pleased. Now that the war was over, just what was it like to return home to Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, after months and even years of service? Beautiful. I. I was taken to the hospital, taken to the airport. They were going to fly me across. I was extremely wounded. They had a big hole in my head that they they didn't even put a plate in. They were they have shell fragments that went clear through, and they were afraid to close it because they didn't know if it was going to be infected or not but they took good care of me. And I didn't have to get up and do KP. I didn't have to do anything for myself. They treated me like a <laughs> prize guy because they wanted to make sure that I, well, I couldn't put my head down on a pillow. I folded a, an army blanket that was much more rigid then I didn't have any pressure on the soft spot, that I had no skull to protect the brain. But it worked out. And I got first class care. I got to sleep on the lower bunk in the hospital ship coming back, the Chateau Ferry, 
and my dad had served on the Chateau Theory. No, that was a, one of my cousins. He went over. That's a First War vet uh, battlefield, Chateau Theory. But as a Boy Scout and a reader, I read all the First War stories that I could get a hold of. Found out I was in some of the same battles I had read about going across France in the First War, certain places in Germany. When I decided I was going to tell my dad if I ever see him in heaven, if he had done the job right, I wouldn't have had to been back fighting those same people in the same battlefields. But I haven't gone up there to see him yet. <laughs> there was more more to it now in the last few years than, uh, than it was when we first came out of the service. It was, it was just like you were away for a while and uh, you come back home and start working. My dad had a plumbing business in Lansdale way back. He started in the 30s and uh, I worked for him. I started, I went in business with him and temporarily I, then I got, I got out of there but I didn't like it so much. But the point is then you just came back and it was like you went on vacation for a while and, and you come home and get right back in the routine. And I don't know of anything, uh, anything to be, you know, anything. I didn't think we'd done nothing special or anything like that. I, said, I just, it was, it was just like coming back and going to, after a long vacation and, and, uh, and going back to work. Well, I could have gotten a job with PWA as an engineer, but I said, no way. I, would. I had a father. My mother was dead, but I had a father and a sister, and, and uh, I wanted to get back to see everybody. Well, that was it. No more harm. I took a train from San Francisco to Philadelphia. I was told that if I got, when I got to San Francisco, I, there was a Navy personnel there who would pay me, so I would have enough money to get home. But I was so anxious to get home that I just didn't even bother to get the money. So with five dollars in my pocket, I proceeded to take a train to Philadelphia. Ran out of money the first night. Um, I wired my cousin in Chicago to meet me there at the train station to pump me up with some money so I could eat something before I got home. Missed our connection with my cousin. So I had no money and I had about a day and a half to go to get home. Well, we had on the train a drunken, very drunken chief warrant officer. And he said to me, do you know where I can get some booze? And I said, yes, I do, because I've been stationed in Chicago. So I took him to a state store and uh, he bought the booze. And there was a huge stack of gallon wine bottles standing there he staggered into it and smashed all those wine bottles i don't know how i did this but i managed to grab his arm with one hand grab the money with the other and get out of the store with the clerk chasing us down one street and down another before he finally gave up, leaving the store open. And I was able to get back to the train before it took off. That was kind of hairy. <laughs> but anyway, he gave me five bucks. So I was able to get somebody to eat. This is perhaps the most important question I ask these men. If there is one specific event that defined their experience, what was that event? We had a Rocky, Rodney the Rock comic strip when he used to 
dive into a stone wall and knock the stones off. Well, he said, just call me Rodney the Rock. I got hit in the head. I didn't even know it penetrated. They told me I, I had a plate in my head, can't eat off of it. And when I came to and found out I had a head injury, I said, oh, just call me Rodney. Nothing's going to hurt my head. But I found out later, much to my shock, that it had penetrated, went clear through. I've got shells, shell fragments here. But they had a hole there, and I couldn't even put my head down on a pillow because it, was, it would cave in if I stood up and it would swell out if I laid down. I had to get a firm pillow to put my head on to keep it from pressing on my soft spot. But I exhaled, thank you, Lord, all the time, always. But I'm still de not dead. Oh, 40 years or so, they contacted me. They were having a reunion over in Denver, the opposite side of the country. And they wanted to know where I was buried. I showed up out there, and they all shook, their, shook my hand and said, Bill, I've mourned you for 40 years. We didn't even call a medic. We thought you were dead. Your brain was sticking out. They didn't check me closely, but I'm still breathing. I had a problem one time when I, the second ship we picked up was made a little different inside. And on the, on the deck where the tanks came in, uh, my ship for the shop was right off of that. And uh, the, the lathe and stuff we had, we had all the machine work to do. Well, the second one, that was just a storage and they put our shop down the shaft on the sides. You had to go down the ladder, two stories, to get into your shop. And you imagine carrying all the acetylene and all your tanks you had. So I burned all that stuff off the deck that they had there and I moved everything over to this storage place and done away with that while we're going down the Mississippi. And uh, no, the captain didn't know what was going on or anything like that. We just were moving the stuff around to put it back like my first ship. If I was never on the first one, I'd have never known what we had there, see? And of course, the lathe and everything was still in that storage space, but our, all our benches and the welding outfits were all in the storage, in this shaft alley. And, uh, and we moved all of that and welded it back down and painted it made it look just like it was on my first ship. Well, be, right before we got to New Orleans, the captain found out about it. And he screamed. And he says, you're the, oh, I can't tell you what he said. He, he just screamed. And he said, you know what you've done? You took a United States, you took a ship that's going to the United States Navy after the shakedown, if it's approved, and you changed the thing, the blueprints. He said, you changed the ship. He said, you know what you're done? I said, no, I made it safer. I told him I made it safer. And I explained to him why we done it. And uh, we would have fell down that shaft, you'd be killed, see? And you, uh, it was very dangerous. And he says, well, I'm telling you one thing. He said, if anything, if those guys, when they come on, you know, the, the inspectors, they were all admirals for the Navy for they come in to approve the ship or not approve it. He said, if, if, they, if they say this, he says, you and I both will be at the brig for the rest of the war in the jail in, in Texas. He said, that's where it is in Texas. And, and, but he, he, he couldn't believe it. He says, I, I never met anybody so dumb, so stupid. And he went on like that. And we got down there, had to shake, it went out to, uh, around, off of uh, Florida there, and it's time for the admirals. They all come on there with their guys behind her with a with a book, writing all this down. They went in the ship, one into the other, and come out. Nothing. They didn't, they didn't have a clue. I mean, I knew they would because they don't they don't know a blueprint from whatever. But anyway, I got away with that one. But that was 
really, uh, as far as the Navy was concerned, that was a serious offense to uh, change anything. Move, I mean, I, I changed the whole department, I mean, the whole thing. But uh, I said it was safer, and that was my point. It wasn't just to do it. And I think the captain answer had calmed down a little bit. I don't know how many days it took him, but uh, my name was mud with him away for a while. But once we got past that inspection, he, he could sort of see my point. And so he sat down and thought about it. So then it was okay. Well, we had small things, like we were the first ones to have the electric uh, heaters for your food. The, the airlines took over after that, but you could put the tray in with the food and a microwave would cook it. And, uh, but other than that, I was in a on TV, not TV, but radio one time, and I was there with magnesium, I mean, throttle and all, and the, the uh, announcer said, oh, here we are at the end of the runway, all set to take off, and roof turned the engines up, and we're, here we go, we're landing, we're taking off. We're up in the air. They were sitting in the same place. And while I was there at the bank of the river, this guy says to me, uh, wipe my boats off, will you, soldier? I said, yes, sir. And I didn't realize it, that it was the general. And I wiped these boots off before we went into Germany. It, uh, <laughs> and then I seen the picture that they had for the general. <laughs> I had to laugh at it, but uh, it was true. I, it, uh, he was a funny guy and he <laughs> wasn't scared of nothing. It didn't matter where it was, he was ready to go. <laughs> but uh, uh, at that spot, I was newly laid. I don't say we, the bunch ahead of us, uh, laid the wood, wooden bridge across. So we could get over the river. The river was pretty fast there. <laughs> we got on the other side. Uh, there's a sign there with four names on it. And uh, one in the middle was a buddy of mine from Lansdale. Never saw him over there. And we kept pushing him back till we got him back of the river. And then we had a sweat until we got on the other side. And this, we just de demanded that they be blown up. And we did get that done. But that was about all. Uh, they, uh, I, I would say they were anxious. The men, men were anxious to get over the river because they knew if they got over the river, they could get to the beds. The big guns is what we were worried about. They were all lined up and facing our shores here, and believe it or not, Lansdale was on the map for bombing. Yeah, that uh, I don't think they ever got any 
thing near here, but it was planned. It wasn't easy to find the spots that they had to go, because they had them all covered up and everything. But we got to them, and uh, when they got to them, they just blew them apart. <laughs> they did that because they didn't want to use them uh, against them or us. We wanted them out of the service. And they did get them out of the service. I was on duty on a particular night when, uh, let's see, 1944, sometime in 1944, when one of them, um, I had an office right below the control tower, and one of the enlisted men came running down and he said, they're shooting at one of our pilots. And so I ran up to the control tower and uh, this pilot was screaming that he was being shot at. So I told him to get out of the area until I could find out what was going on. Evidently, the IFI, IFF, which was the communication beacon that communicated between his aircraft and the Army um, basic control, which uh, controlled the anti-aircraft, were in communication, basically. In this case, something happened, it wasn't working. And uh, that's why the guy was being shot at. He was doing practice landings and takeoffs. Uh, when this was happening, and uh, so uh, I immediately tried to determine what was going on. I tried to get hold of the basic uh, anti-aircraft unit, and all I got was a busy seeking. This is kind of interesting because it shouldn't have worked that way. Um, at the same time, the island was being blacked out, and um, we had not only a land base, but a seaplane base. And there was a triangle uh, with three seaplane runways. And it was bordered with lights. And uh, I realized that we did not have a control switch for the lights on this seaplane channel. I was told that uh, the switch was controlled by a small army unit around the bend. I called this unit. The young private did not know where the switch was. But I told him to find the switch and turn the lights on. Um, very quickly after that, I got a call from Pearl Harbor saying uh, that I had lights on, turned them off immediately. I called the private. He still could not find the light switch. Um, then I got another call, this time from an admiral at Pearl Harbor, and he used some very flowery language to insist that I get the lights off right now. I called the boathouse and I told them to take a boat and a shotgun and go out and shoot those lights out. And they proceeded to do that. <laughs> By that then Things started to quiet down. Uh, I was able to get through to the anti-aircraft, tell him and somebody else called him and told him to stop it. I called my man and told him to come home. And uh, I heard nothing further about the whole thing. For this question, there was no right or wrong answer. But just what were these men most proud of in their military service?
that I was taking my own risks. I didn't want anyone to be responsible for me. I didn't want to have to tell someone else what to do. But like I said, wherever, whatever, I was obedient, but I didn't want to tell someone else. Well, I just that I did it, did what I was supposed to do and did it. We uh, just lived the army of life. And I liked it. It would never go, you know, you wouldn't give a million dollars for the experience, but you'd never go through it again. And that's the way I felt about it. I'm not sure whether we were the fifth or the sixth group in. We went in, in, in groups at that time. And we, they had it that uh, the groups would enter at a different spot every time along the river, anywhere along there. So that if one bunch were wiped out, the next bunch could talk, go in and take over. That's a, their way of putting it. Uh, to me, it looked like all the men just keep walking and going right on through, shooting all the time when they were through. Uh, I would say that we we had enough man manpower and equipment that they'd never stop us. We'd just keep right on going. We lost a lot of men that way, but we won. That's the big thing. Well, I guess I was most proud of being able to save the life of the guy that was in the aircraft that was being shot at and um, getting through that horrible night. The social and political landscape of America has changed enormously since the times of World War II, even right here in Lansdale. If there's one thing these men would like our generation to know, what would that be? Uh, I would say you should know more than we did and not go in. <laughs> no, no, you gotta, actually there is some, uh, what do you say, uh, a part about you want to go in because of your country is being attacked and, and you want to you wanna do your share of protecting it. So I would say you guys should think of the same thing. Uh, but today, you don't know about it. There's so much stuff going on you don't know if uh, uh, if they have that. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word uh, uh, for thinking of your country. What is it? Uh, patriotism. Hmm? Patriotism. Patriotism, like that. I don't. I think today would be harder. I often thought about it. I think today would be harder to get a whole group of guys. I'm talking millions of them from all over the United States to go to war. You know. You know what I mean. I think they would protest more. I, mean, I really do. That, that's what I think. But I would say that I think the, the younger guys, if they had to, should go uh, if they're called and, uh, and do what they can. It's, uh, it's a personal thing for people to have think like to do what they want to do. But as, as a general, uh, in general, at that time, Everybody seemed to be ready to go, you know, because our country was attacked after Pearl Harbor when that happened. Before that happened, most of the people were against going to war. Roosevelt, who was president, he had a hard time because England was pushing to have him come in to help them because they were losing and they knew they were in trouble. And, and uh, Japan was sort of working on it to get into it. And, but he, he could not convince the people, American people, 
we want to go to war. They didn't want to do that. But after Pearl Harbor, that same day, that was it. They declared war and everybody just got on the bandwagon, so to speak. And everything, you know, people at home, they didn't have it so easy either. They had a, they were rationed. I mean, my mother had to watch out, had to get stamps to get food. And you could only get so much sugar or so much bread or certain things. You couldn't get gas. You had to have stamps to get gas. And they were sort of handicapped too from, from the standard way of living. So uh, they, they gave, the people back home gave up stuff too uh, for it. So they were involved really that way. Uh, so that's the, I would think today though it would be a little harder to get the whole group like that, if everybody just to join in as one, so to speak, because there's too many protesters out there to, today for anything that happens. Uh, and I think they would have a problem. Times were entirely different than what they are now. We, Lane still was a uh, center for factories. We had a sign on the railroad, along the railroad, it said, Lansdale, home of diversified industries. 80, 80 industries. And it was an entirely different uh, feeling. We had Christmas parties, we had decorations over the street. By the way, we flew over Lansdale several times and we tipped our wings but nobody ever said that they saw us. I'd like them to know that the Second World War did not end all wars. And um, that it was not long after that that another war came along and then another war came along. And then uh, the, the desert war went on. Uh, so the Bible says there are going to be wars and wars and wars until the end comes. And uh, I think that's pretty much where we are. Uh, people don't seem to be able to get along together. No sooner than we end a war than we want to start another one. I, I'm glad that I'm not 21 years old today. I fear for my grandkids. That's, that's up to us now. And you're one of, of that group. Yeah. How old are you? I'm 17. 17. Wow. Well, I was just a little older than that. I was 19 when I, no, I was 20 when I went into the Navy. Um, doesn't seem all that long since. I was your age, but time goes by very quickly. And I hope that you will not have to go through any, there's no such thing as a good war. And there might be a lot of glory, but there's far more uh, blood than glory. That was the 1940s. Now, at the time that this was filmed, it's 2017. That's over 70 years since then. Over 16 million Americans fought in World War II, but now their numbers dwindle. I knew I had to do this project because these men are running out of time to share their stories. Soon, the world will be left with nothing but artifacts and written accounts to tell the story of one of the most important wars in human history. I hope from this project that members of my community will be inspired to reach out to their hometown heroes and to hear their stories, because they are a part of history, which must be preserved for future generations. I'm Zach McCool, and on behalf of the Boy Scouts of America, North Penn Television, and the Lansdale Hometown Heroes Project, thank you for watching. Thank you so much for coming out. My pleasure. Give me the Boy Scout shake here <laughs> some way. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and okay. telling us. Tell You're us quite about welcome. You. Thank you for your service. Right. Thank you so much for your service. Yeah. Thank you for uh, letting us come out here.
thank you. Thank you so much for doing I, this. Um, I, I hope I helped you. It's a pleasure, Zach. Um, in all the years since I have uh, served, I don't think I've ever been interviewed before. So uh, I hope that whoever hears my story will um, get a little taste of what it was about.